bring that to life now. Anyway, stop the So the first slide here shows a couple of examples of um, raw data obtained from the measurement of various different chemical species in the atmosphere. And what I want to try and illustrate here is is how most atmospheric problems, or most environmental problems, I should say, uh, rather than being the result of a single process, are usually the result of a, of a set of overlapping processes. So the first example here is, is called smog. And this occurred in, uh, well, it occurred in various big cities, but it particularly occurred in London in the 1950s. What was observed is as in various different dates through the year, uh, so this is December, you see as, as the date progresses through December, the level of particles and the level of SO2 present in the atmosphere show sudden peaks. So what happens is that uh, the, 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 it's reason, the weather's reasonably clear over these days, and all of a sudden, for some reason or other, then there's a big <coughs> peak in the number density of particles and a big peak in the concentration of sulfur dioxide. And the thing that obviously is, is worrying here is that this was correlated with an increase in the, in the number of deaths. So there's a clear link between the presence of these particles and the presence of SO2 and the mortality in the city. And these things track so regularly that this spike here is quite clearly epidemiologically uh, related to the, 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 the increase in the, in the number of deaths. So, hang on, there we go. increase in particles, sudden increase in SO2. Now, have I showed you on my graph that this is some, since somehow related to mortality, but why do these suddenly increase? Because nothing changed in that period of time in terms of the same number of people were burning fuel and the same number of people were, were using transport around London. The main additional effect weather conditions. <coughs> and what happens is that in the certain conditions, because London is, is a bowl, effectively even there are hills all the way around it, apart from the, the Thames estuary to the east, what happens is you get in a, in a dip like this, under certain weather conditions you get what's called a, a temperature inversion. So what you get is you get cold air sort of trapping all the chemical and emissions inside. So you have, uh, we have emissions of soot and smoke. And instead of being able to escape and dissipate, they get trapped in the same place. So what you get in the, under these conditions is you, you've got uh, the soot and the smoke, which gives rise to, to particles and SO2, and it's trapped effectively in a reactor. So what happens is these things then start to uh, undergo various different chemical processes. So what happens is you have particles become acidified, so the SO2 becomes SO3 which becomes sulfuric acid, so these particles are, uh, have got coatings of sulfuric acid on them, and hydrated. So by hydrated what they do is they pick up water vapour. So the overall effect of this is to, uh, is to create a series of particles which can, uh, are the right sort of size to get into the lungs. They can go straight through the alveoli into the bloodstream and they cause uh, hypertension and such like they interact with the cardiovascular <coughs> system. And as a result of that, they, they end up uh, being able to kill people that are particularly vulnerable.
Okay, so the particles formed are appropriately sized to enter the cardiovascular system. So that's the that's the method, the mechanism by which they cause deaths. So, having understood the atmospheric chemistry side of it, a little bit of what's going on, the next thing is to try and understand what you can do about it. That's where the where the knowledge comes in. So the simplest way to deal with this, you can't well. What can you do with, do something about, and what can't you do something about? Well, the thing that you can't do anything about is the weather, so you have to find some other way of ameliorating the, the effect. And the way you do that is using emission controls. And the first of these was a piece of legislation, several pieces of legislation, called the Clean Air Act, which uh, first came into force in the 1950s, and that banned the burning of high carbon, uh, sorry, high soot um, fossil fuels. So, so uh, this is where you get smokeless coal. The biggest uh, implication of this is certain areas. And actually this legislation still exists to these days. In central Manchester you can't burn smoky coal. There are various uh, uh, emission regulations associated with, associated with that. And that's why when you go into, into the coal merchants and you see there are different grades, out in the countryside you can burn the dirty old black stuff that gives out loads of smoke and all kinds of other nasties because it gets dissipated. But in the town you have to have coal which has most of the sulphur taken out of it. They use steam treatment to to steam out all of the noxious chemicals, all the things that uh, that would cause it to smoke. So, smokeless coal has, uh, in, to some extent, uh, ameliorated the problem completely. Although you still, in some areas of the world, you still do see some problems with uh, smoky emissions. Uh, it's reasonably well understood. So that's the first one. Let me just go back to this. Oh, it's there. Hopefully, we can uh, stay long enough for me to explain something. So this is meteorolo meteorology and some particles and such like. Now, another thing which was observed in the uh, late 70s and early 80s uh, was the evolution of trace species like this. In um, This is from Los Angeles. And what we have is we have various different kinds of gas phase... Oh. Various different kinds of gas phase processes going on here. So this is what we call uh, photo photochemical smog. And what we've got is we've got a gas phase species being generated. Okay, so in this case here we had direct emission of particles. In this case, the emissions are these things here. So the, two, the key things are this lot here, which are called non-methane hydrocarbons, and these things, this stuff here, which is NO2, nitrogen dioxide. So you can see from the time of day, this is pollution from cars, etc. It's not just pollution from cars, it's cars, buses, lorries, businesses turning the stuff on, power generation, because people have just put the toaster on to make some people breakfast. <coughs> but the, the key to the, understanding the problem here is looking at how these things evolve over time. So the first thing that happens is you have the emissions. The second thing you see is hyd the, the hydrocarbon emissions go down. They go down for two reasons. The first they go down because there's less transportation after the rush hour is over, so they go down because the emissions have gone down. But the, the second reason that they've gone down is that they've gone down because some chemistry is starting to go on, and it's chemistry related to NO2 and to do, and to do with the hydrocarbons themselves. But what we do see is we see different kinds of species increasing. So these aldehydes here, these are secondary gas phase products. Okay, so these aldehydes are starting to be produced, but the other thing that's also produced is this trace here, which is called oxidant, and I'll say a little bit more about that when I get back to be able to write on the projector.
So what we've got, we've got here is a, a correlation, and what we get here, after this oxidant has been formed, it's not shown on this graph, but at this point here, this is the point at which we see particles being formed. So there's something else going on here as well, which isn't shown on this graph, you can tell it from the time of the day, is over this period of time, sunlight. So we've got emissions, we've got sunlight, we've got chemical processing, we've got oxidized species like aldehydes being formed, and we've got oxidant, which you'll see the predominant oxidants are ozone and the hydroxyl radical. And as a result of that, we start to see particles being formed. And this is the, 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 the chemical explanation for what's known as the Los Angeles smog. from cars, from transportation. So this is organic chemicals. And NOx, let's we'll call this in, 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 a, in a bit. By NOx, I mean NO and NO2, the sum of the two together. we get is sunlight. This is photochemistry. Okay, we see oxidized organics being formed predominantly aldehydes, and you'll see when we look at this in a bit more detail, when we look at these organic chemical cycles, why it should be aldehydes. And we also see oxidants. Oxidants are predominantly, in the daytime, ozone and this species, OH, the hydroxyl radical. Okay, and there are two important things that these things do. This is the hydroxyl radical is the most reactive species in the atmosphere. Okay, and the way it reacts, it reacts however it wants to react, it can pull functional groups off, it pulls protons off anything, because OH, the, the proton affinity of OH is higher than any other species. So if OH comes into contact with any hydrocarbon, the first thing it does is it pulls the proton off the hydrocarbon and leaves a hydrocarbon radical behind. And there's a whole chain of complicated chemistry that goes on from the hydrocarbon radical, which, is, which cause um, a variety of different oxidized, oxidized products to be formed. So OH is the most reactive species in the air and reacts with everything. Ozone reacts with any double bond, CC double bond, to be explicit there. So any, any kind of these organic species that have got any kind of unsaturation in them, then what you get is you get ozone added across them, and that creates a load of other kinds of oxidized species. they produce organic chemicals which are highly oxidized. So the emissions might be things like you know, propane and, and uh, benzene and toluene and stuff like that. The results of the reactions, the oxidation reactions, are things with lots more oxygens added to them. Anything with oxygen added to it generally has a lower vapor pressure than a 
free gas phase molecule. The, 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 the archetype would be ethane is a gas, ethanol is a liquid at room temperature. And it's the oxygen that gives rise to things like um, intermolecular interactions, like hydrogen bonding that reduces the vapor pressure. And it's the same for most things in the atmosphere. So if you take these volatile organic compounds and you oxidize them, they become more condensable. These species are less volatile than what they want to do is they want to condense and they have two ways in which they can condense. They can either condense onto the surface of particles that are already there or they can form new particles themselves. onto existing particles, for example soot, or if the vapor pressure of them is high enough, they can, they can what, what we call nucleate. Or new particles. And it's not just as simple as that, those are the two extremes. What happens is that some species will homogeneously nucleate to form new particles, and then other stuff will stick on them as well and water will be taken up and all kinds of things like that. So what we end up with is, over the, over the day, you start off with clean air, and it gets progressively sunnier and dirtier as the pollution arrives, and then you get all these different organic species being formed, chemistry going on, and then you end up with particles being formed. Of course, these particles are costly. So if they're toxic, we need to do something about it. Well, again, you need then to consider what is it that you can do something about and what is it that you can't do anything about. Well, in Los Angeles, you can't do anything about the sunshine. You also can't do anything about the fact that there's a, there's a big sort of bowl facing west on the coast. So if the wind's coming in from the west, it keeps all the air trapped in the city. So uh, un under some circumstances, all these things will get sort of blown out to sea. But if the wind's from the west and it's sunny, then there's going to be smog in Los Angeles. So the only thing you can do is ameliorate some of the emissions. Again, how do we reduce emissions? Well, there are several ways that, uh, that these emissions can be, can be dealt with. What I said, if you looked at the, the original slide, is I showed that there was nitrogen oxides related there, there was organic chemicals related there, but also there are um, the, the, the formation of these things by nucleation onto particles. So we can do it in several ways. We can do, we can either reduce NOx, so this is NO plus NO2. We can reduce organics. Or we can reduce particles. And Californian legislation over the last 20 or 30 years has done all of this. They started off with NOx reduction. NOx reduction is catalytic converters, so the gases coming out of the engine don't come out as NO or NO2, they come out as N2O or, or N, uh, N2. Uh, you can reduce organic emissions using again, catalytic technology or cleaner fuels, so one of the ways to reduce organics is to make the fuel burn better, and it burns better if there's less gobbo in it, so if, if, if you purify the, the fuel more, then you'll get fewer emissions from it. The other thing you can do is you can reduce particles, so if you have a cleaner burning engines, it's the engines themselves that create the particles onto which the, the stuff that's being produced sticks, so if you reduce the particle concentration, then also you reduce the surfaces for some of these things to, to condense onto. And current legislation in um, California is some of the strictest emission controls from vehicles in the world. And many cars are fit, well, all cars are fitted with, with filters for, for NOx and particles. And uh, the organic uh, reduction strategy is something which is ongoing through different fuel formulations. So, not only do you need to understand uh, the, the, the chemistry in terms of the species that are present at any instantaneous sort of moment in time, you also need to understand atmospheric problems. 
to have time evolution of various different species, and from that time evolution, you then infer what chemistry must have been occurring. Time evolution of chemical species. We need to understand meteorology, the so weather, we need those on a local and a global scale. Finally, we need models, because you can't just, I mean I've just explained this by looking at the traces, but you can't do it just by looking at the traces in a real world environment, what you need to do is you need to have a model with all the chemical species in it, and all the rate constants for the, for the species reacting with each other, and you've got to run it forward in time, you've got to have field measurements measuring the concentration of species, and then you have your model moving forward in time, predicting the concentration of species, and if the model and the data that you've got from the field look exactly the same, then the model's right, so you understand the chemistry. And if the model's right, you can then adjust some of the chemistry. You can, you can take some of the material out, so you can, you can do a, a sort of like a, an in-computer um, pollution abatement strategy. You can just reduce the NOx levels or something like that in the model and see whether the things that you want to get rid of in the model then disappear in the model. And chances are that if they did, if you do that abatement strategy in real life, the stuff will then disappear as well. But if the model doesn't track the measurements very accurately, then there's something missing from the model. So then you go back to the lab, and then you have to try and work out what's going on. <coughs> so the importance of models is models are constructed using chemical reactions. Okay, so mechanisms, rates, Etc. So data is collected from the field. Okay, so a bit of a tongue in cheek. I mean, data collected from the field by the field here. I mean, in the middle of downtown Los Angeles. It's not really much like a field, but it's out in, out in, in the wild in the environment. run forward in time and compare to data versus time. Okay, so if they agree, the model is okay. If they don't, something is missing. back to the lab. And in the lab what you do is you, you would construct, you might see some various different species uh, evolving in the field that the model doesn't predict. So then you go and see in the lab if you can if you can find any reactions which produce this. the lab, but not just back to the lab to randomly look for reactions, back to look back to the lab informed by what sort of species were measured in the field to see if you can find any reactions of any of the other species you're not modeling that could effectively help uh, to resolve the problem. OK, 
Okay? So once models are reliable, the ultimate game, the ultimate goal of any kind of atmospheric model, atmospheric sort of science project is to produce a model that is accurate and that can then be used predictively. And if it can be used predictively, you can, you can trial different pollution abatement strategies on the model. example I want to go through uh, just in the last 15-20 uh, minutes of this lecture, we might get a bit further than this, to show you how um, it needn't necessarily be something that we encounter every day, something which has a long-term, possible long-term effect, which gets spotted through, um, through observations and can then uh, be understood and then uh, ameliorated or mitigated. So, from the 1980s was what was called stratospheric ozone depletion. observed was um, from some satellite measurements, well, so from some ground based and some satellite measurements, that uh, at certain times of the year, the ozone which is present in the atmosphere is, gets destroyed in a certain part of the atmosphere. Now it turns out that this, this whole procedure is really quite complicated, but we shall look at this in detail, but what, what there is in the atmosphere is a, is a function of altitude. So here's, here's altitude, and here's concentration of ozone. There's very little ozone down in the troposphere, a bit, but not much. And as you go up in the atmosphere, you find that there's a, a belt of ozone centered in the lower stratosphere. And this is what you heard referred to, no doubt, as the ozone layer. It's uh, about 20 kilometers up and higher. And as we shall see when we look at later uh, lectures of ozone chemistry in, in detail, what the ozone light does is it shields out. It's got a strong absorption soft section in the 200 to 300 nanometer region where photons from the sun actually can get through the atmosphere, or they would be able to get through the atmosphere. So what the ozone layer does is it blocks out this harmful ultraviolet radiation, which is the right, just the right sort of wavelength to cause mutations in DNA. So it's very dangerous to, to biology. It blocks out 200 to 300 nanometer UV light. So in the late 70s, early 80s, it was, it was observed that at certain times of the year, over the Antarctic, for some reason, nobody had any kind of idea why, that large losses in the in ozone were observed. So I trust this one and write on it. If it goes out, shout at me, I might not notice. So what happens is, this is what the ozone layer is supposed to look like, the blue line there. That's the average. And in the late austral winter and early spring, so October is end of winter, start of spring in Australia, in, in the Antarctic, these red measurements are observed. And in these red measurements, you can see that the ozone layer is almost completely lost. It goes right the way down to almost zero. So something clearly has destroyed that ozone. And eventually, after a few months, towards, towards Christmas time, the ozone layer is observed to have refilled and it, it comes back again. So what happens is, it, it's there most of the year, and then in the late winter, early spring, it disappears, and then it comes back again. Now, the other thing is, 
that it only happens over Antarctica. So the purple here, it doesn't show up very well in your handout, I don't think you can see in, in these here, is that where we've got the, the purple there, you can see that it's, it's confined to over the pole. And it's quite well defined, it's almost circular. And when this was first measured by Joe Farman from the British Antarctic Survey from the ground and by NASA from satellite observations, um, nobody was quite sure what was going on. And in fact, the, the, the apocry probably apocryphal story is that um, it was, it was the, the people measuring it from satellites didn't believe it. They thought there was something wrong with their satellite. And it was only when they compared it to some of the ground-based measurements from Joe Farman that they obviously that they, they started to take it seriously, that it wasn't something that was wrong with their, their satellite. So what happens is, this, this has in, increased over time, so this is, these are plots of the October, so corresponding to, to this one here, corresponding to the polar stratosphere, uh, as a function of year. So we start up in 79, there's a bit, as the years progress you can see this purple starts to develop, and it gets larger and larger as the years go on. There's also something else going on that you might notice here, is actually it tends to be larger and then a bit smaller, then larger, then a bit smaller, then a bit larger. There's a biennial oscillation as well. Has it gone off now? Come on, wakey wakey. So there's, there's several things going on here. There's, there's confinement to the poles, there's uh, certain times of the year, and also there's a biennial oscillation. We shan't deal with that here. find out what chemicals is it related to. to chemistry of chlorine species, so the species which are involved are chlorine atoms and CLO radicals. And it's related to ice clouds and that it's confined to the pole by winds, what's called in meteorological terms the circumpolar vortex. We'll be dealing with this in a bit more detail when we can look at some examples of chlorine chemistry in the atmosphere. So what happens effectively is you've got uh, some chemicals which are being released. This is anthropogenic pollution from mankind. It's being confined to the poles by a wind which is turning into a vortex, and in that vortex there's some chemistry going on that involves ice clouds. <laughs> so now we're in a different situation. This is up in the stratosphere, so this is 20 kilometers up right over the South Pole. The question that needs to be asked then is what, what effectively can you do about any of this stuff? Because this is damaging biology and such like in the southern hemisphere, and it's getting progressively worse. Okay. 
Okay? And the only way you can do this is you can't get rid of the CL and CLO that's in, the, in that part of the atmosphere. You can't get there. You can't do it anyway. It's too large. The only way you can do it is you can stop it getting there in the first place. And the way to do that is the reduction of, C, of chlorine and, and, and CLO. And through a long chain of events, it was tracked back to being due to what are called chlorofluorocarbons. These are CFCs. So, for example, CF2, Cl2. This is one of the main ones that, that, was, that was used. These were used as refrigerants, and they were used because they were very safe in the troposphere because they don't react with anything, and they don't react with anything, but as soon as they get a whiff of UV and they get up to about 20 kilometers, one of the chlorines falls off. So the only way you can stop that is, you can, is, is by uh, getting rid of these. And the only way of getting rid of these is to find something else that does the same thing. So what they currently use are what are called hydrofluorocarbons and also alkanes and things like that being used now. And they work because they're too reactive and they don't get out of the troposphere. But these can get right out of the troposphere where they get fertilized. So in order to understand this and find the key to solving the ozone hole problem, you have to go right the way back through a series of linked steps. So there's modeling of the processes that give the ozone hole. So that involves meteorology, atmospheric dynamics, it involves chemistry, it involves temporary, temporal evolution of various chemical species. Then you've got to track it back to what it was that's being transformed by these ice clouds, and then you've got to track that back to what species originally came from. And there's about three steps in the chain. This is about 10, 15 years to resolve. The current state of play now is because of what's called the Montreal Protocol. In the early 90s, the use of CFCs has been banned, and the, the concentrations of atmospheric CFCs are going down, and as a result, the ozone hole levels have started to stabilize, and it's predicted that in the next 20 or 30 years, the, the, the magnitude of the Antarctic ozone hole should start to get smaller. So, um, what I've tried to give you a flavor from here is, is how all of these things are connected together, and how uh, we can try and use science to understand what it is that's going on. Now, the last thing I br just briefly want to touch on, I'm not going to, if you look on the, the figures here, there's, there's, a, there's another figure about uh, acid rain as well. I'm not going to bother with that, but it's the same sort of thing. It's pollution being transported and reacted. So like, what I just want to touch upon here is something which is very topical at the moment, and it also involves a lot of current work in atmospheric chemistry. It's one of the things that we'll be, we'll be looking at uh, in quite a bit of detail. What this slide here shows is what's known as the greenhouse effect. Now, we'll look at this in some detail in, in later lectures, but sunlight is what causes most of the energy to appear in the atmosphere. What happens is you have direct um, irradiation of the atmosphere by the sun. The sun heats the planet up, and that re-emits at a longer wavelength. So you've got uh, uh, the solar light has a particular spectrum. The outer curve there shows the solar spectrum. So that's what's irradiating the atmosphere from the top. It's also warming the planet up. And the planet looks like the same sort of shape of source. This is what's called black body emission. But actually, it's irradiating at much longer wavelength because it's infrared, mostly so heat. Right? So parts of the atmosphere are heated directly from above and below by different wavelengths. But also, the molecules and particles in the atmosphere scatter light. They scatter at different wavelengths depending upon what they're made of, what size they are, and all that kind of thing. So the, 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 the distribution of radiation within the atmosphere is very complicated. It's related to the concentrations of species, it's related to the angle of the sun, it's related to the presence of particles and such like that. And what you can perhaps just about see from this chart here is that the, the outer curve there shows solar radiation incident on the top of the atmosphere, and this jagged line underneath shows what the solar radiation profile looks like when you measure it at the planet surface. So there's all sorts of things in there, like CO2 and water, which are absorbing this energy. Now, because this energy's got to go somewhere, it absorbs the energy, it's got to get rid of the energy. It can't just, just heat up and up and up. It, it scatters the, the radiation to different parts of the atmosphere. And this is what's called, um, the, 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 this is related to, to what's called radiative transfer. Okay, so what 
that means effectively is that they're, they're involved in the, in the distribution of the energy supplied by the sun to different parts of the atmosphere. So any monkeying about with any of the levels of any of those chemicals is very likely to have an effect on the distribution of those different uh, of the energy to different parts of the atmosphere. Well, it turns out that things like carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, they're all related because they all have absorptions in this solar spectrum. They all scatter in, the, in that region. And the levels have all been increasing. Well, there may be climate skeptics amongst you. I don't know. But uh, this is the, 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 one of the examples of um, the information that's generally potted together for the effects of those, of those different kinds of things. And this is, uh, in fact, this is the most current one. This is uh, from about... Um, about five or six years ago. But this, this is a figure produced by um, the International Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This is, this is uh, from the IPCC third report. There's a current, the fourth report currently. But this shows the point really accurately, as far as I'm concerned, is, is what this shows here, this graph here, is it shows the amount of change in the radiative transfer. That change is called forcing, radiative forcing. So this represents the amount of change from, from the, 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 the equilibrium balance, effectively. And what this shows is if you add up the effect of all of these gases, then you end up with an effect that's going to be about that big. And this here is the error bar. These are called bar and whisker. So this is the error. And this one here is the mean value. OK, so what this suggests is that the radiative forcing watts per square meter at the surface of the planet due to changes in these gas concentrations is going to be about two and a half watts per square meter, give or take about half a watt per square meter. So uh, this is reasonably well understood. There's still quite a lot of holes in the models because modeling it's very difficult. And that's where a lot of the uh, skepticism comes from is because the models can't really pin this down to particularly accurate and they can't, they can't move forward in time particularly well with, with any degree of reliability. So, so this, is, this is current state of the art, this is where all of the knowledge is. Now what this graph also shows on the bottom is what's called the level of scientific understanding. And we have quite a high understanding of all of the processes that cause to both the emission, chemistry, transformation, and all of, the, of these kind of species here. However, what's not understood at all is the effect of some of this other stuff here. And particularly, what I'm going to concentrate on in some of the later lectures is the effect of all of these things. These are called aerosols, and aerosols are basically the dust in the atmosphere. And in these particular cases, some of them have negative forcing, that means they cool the atmosphere. Some of them have positive forcing, which means they warm the atmosphere. And some of them, well, there's a bigger, there's, there's a massive error bar there, and actually no known magnitude for whether mineral dust, bits from volcanoes and stuff like that in the atmosphere, are going to cool the atmosphere down or they're going to warm it up. And there's also things to do with the way aerosols cause clouds and such like. Uh, that's, a, that's also unknown. So this, the reason I wanted to show you this last is that this is an area where there's been quite a lot of scientific development to understand some of the gas-based stuff, but there's actually still a huge amount not understood. And this is an area of active research in atmospheric science um, around the world, trying to, first of all, people are trying to quantify the size of these effects. People are trying to quantify and reduce the size of these error bars. And there are actually many processes which are starting to be understood these days that don't actually yet appear on this diagram to do with the way these particles uh, do things. For example, some of these particles here can, can act as vectors to move chemicals from different parts of the atmosphere. Things stick to the aerosols and they get blown to different parts of the atmosphere with winds and then they get brought up again. So there's all kinds of stuff here that's not really well quantified or, or well understood. So, to end this lecture and to start our track of understanding all of the science behind the chemistry of the atmosphere so that we can start to make some progress at understanding some of these processes, I'll leave you this, with this slide which shows you that uh, even though many of the things I've talked about are very well understood and we've been studying the atmosphere for a hundred years, we now know that we know less about the atmosphere than we thought we did and uh, we should find out something about that. Okay, right, thank you. I shall now go and complain.